Uh, next speaker is uh, Julian Schlesser, uh, who will uh, present joint work with Luca and Zlaty. This is a nice uh, presentation. Uh, Zlaty cycle, inferential expressivism application. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Jojo. Thank you, everybody, for coming. So much fun so far. And um, thank you for Luca for doing the heavy lifting all of this work. So I get to do the fun parts now. Also, hi, <laughs> so, if you're listening, I appreciate you being there. Um, okay, we know what inferential expressivism is, and we've seen a little bit what we can do with it. Um, so now we have kind of our fancy hexagon, all the basic speech acts that like jointly co determine meanings, whatever. But let's see what we can do with that idea. And so I have a few things prepared for you. So Luca made this grand claim that we can explain the Austin sentences, but perhaps um, it's up to me to back that up a little bit. So we can't talk about this. Then for our metaethicists, we are going to talk about moral language and moral attitudes a little bit. For our philosophers of language, we're talking about conditionals a little bit. I'm a little bit scared Frank is here, but let's see how it goes. And in the end, I um, will present some sketches, very vague sketches of some more work you can do with this. It, we, because we noticed that you can't really fit a whole book in two hours. So, well, that's what you get. All right, y'all seen it more. So, so here the well-known Yeltsin observation from one of the most cited papers this century, I think. It is raining and might not be raining sounds terrible. Um, suppose it is raining and might not be raining also sounds terrible. And that might be a surprise to you if you have done a philosophy undergrad because you've learned this thing here, the more paradox, that it is raining and I don't know it's not raining, sounds bad, and suppose it is raining and I don't know it's not raining, sounds good. So the meaning of might cannot be something like I don't know it is not. And that is strange. It's just strange. And the most plausible explanation of what's going on here, I think, we think, is that Yeltsin senses, they are semantically bad. They, they are inconsistent. They don't go into any context well. Whereas more sequences, they are not semantically bad. They are pragmatically bad. There's something bad about asserting them but there's nothing bad about the sentence itself. And so it goes into a few more contexts. And as Luca said, um, expressivism about might purports to explain this by saying that expressivism about might, this is always bad. However, expressivism about might then also has to exp explain what it means for something to go under post in the traditional expressivists. Well, that's a pretty huge problem. We have to explain that. And we claim that inferential expressivism can explain it. And so it goes something like this. Um, the more sentence or the no, you need to take out scene sequence, it's just like your everyday contradiction. It is raining and it is not raining, it's bad, and it's also bad in the suppose. Suppose it is raining and it is not raining. And so what's the problem with this? So according to inferential expressivism, the problem with this is asserting a contradiction commits you to an absurdity. Formally, this means that asserting is a plus P e and not P e entails a bottom. And by the conjunction rules, from this one we get p and plus not p. By the negation rules, from here we get minus p. And then by the coordination principles, plus p and minus p are bottom. Good. And now we can observe well, the Yeltsin sequence, p and it, and diamond not p, also entails bottom. So by the conjunction rules, we get plus p and plus not p. Now, by, then by the episteme, there's a diamond here. By the epistemic model rules, you get. Uh, o plus not p, and by the negation rules, then you get O minus p, and that is contradictory with plus p. So both of these senses, when you utter them, commits you to an absurdity, and they are therefore inconsistent in the same way. Yeltsin senses pattern with contradictions. They are contradictions. Um, but the problem is then, why, why does committing yourself to a contradiction mean that a sentence sounds bad? because you can utter all kinds of sentences that commit you to a contradiction that don't sound immediately bad. Um, so as Luca said, the logic validates classical logic. So it entails bottom to a certain negation of first law. And I mean, I can I can try to read it out. <laughs> so it's not the case that if, if P then Q, then P then P. <laughs> um, if you say that you committed yourself to an absurdity, but it's obviously not sounding bad to deny person's law. And I think 
if you are like a novice logician, you do that all the time, or right? at least you say like, oh, this might be false. I don't see why this can be true. These are all not very absurd things to say. Um, but the problem here, so the distinction here is the proof of Peirce's law is very difficult to see. It's actually a very good exercise for advanced undergraduate students even to derive this. And in this sense, it is unlike these classical contradictions and Yasin sentences, because the absurdity of a classical contradiction is in the technical sense immediate. And the relevant notion of immediacy here is that all you have to do is to take the meaning conferring rules, the basic rules that govern negation and conjunction, and you use them to simplify. So in the proof tree, you just go downwards, um, to make, the, make the formula simpler, and you reach a contradiction. If you start a proof tree with the negation of Peirce's law and you try to simplify with just the rules for negation and the conditional, you're not going to get anywhere because you need it's a it's a classic it's a classically but not intergistically valid sentence so you need some finagling with the law to the middle and so here you take the meaning conferring rules for Yasin sentences you get a contradiction for Peirce's law and other things that commit you to an absurdity but not immediately you need to be smart about it and if you have to be smart about it it doesn't sound terrible to assert it. But then, and so, and so then the claim is, well, this means that the classical predictions and the ultimate senses, they just operate the same way. It's absurd to assert them because they are immediately contradictory. It's absurd, absurd to suppose them. It's absurd to put them in the antecedents of conditionals because in neither, in all the cases, you have a contradiction there. And it might be the case that for vacuity reasons, you can have the Yeltsin sentence in a true conditional, fine, but you can also have a um, contradiction in a true conditional, and that still sounds weird, even though your logic says it's true, and so it's something to do with like zero models, as George has explained. So this is good. So we have the Yeltsin sentence on really all fours with the classical contradictions. But then what about these more sentences? And so the difference to the more sentences is, this does not commit you to bottom. You can assert it's raining and I don't believe that it is, and there's no proof of bottom from there. Um, but, and I'm taking this from um, Baker and Woods to 2015 that we got from Jack. Um, it is unclear here what the speaker is trying to say. That's the characteristic reaction towards the Moore sentence. Like, I'm telling you, oh, it's raining, but I don't believe that it is, so I don't know that it is. And then you're like, what, Julian? <laughs> what are you trying to do in the conversation? And that's a different kind of thing. That's pragmatic incoherence. And um, again, by immediate commitment via the conjunction rules, if I utter a more sense, if I assert a more sense to you, then I am committed to expressing belief towards it is raining, and I'm committed to a certain descriptive claim about my psychology. I'm committed to not having that belief. And so if I'm committed to expressing something, and I'm also committed to not having that with that, which I express, then you're a little bit confused because expression is me letting you partake in my psychology. And then I'm saying, oh, but don't treat me as partaking in my psychology. And so then the reaction is, well, what are you trying to tell me? But obviously that doesn't happen under suppose because if I say suppose it is raining and I don't believe that it is, then my utterance of it is raining is not inviting you to partake in my psychology of believing. So it's perfectly clear um, so it's perfectly clear what I'm trying to say when I have this opposition, because there's no such contradiction with me, between me expressing and me reporting on my psychology. And so with that being said, we will come back to this later because I need some of these notions for the moral language. But let's do something um, perhaps a little bit more involved, moral language. And Luca already anticipated um, many of the important beats here, but just to go over them again, because it's important. So these thin moral terms, like right and wrong, the traditional expressivist view is that they don't describe, but instead they are expressing your moral or conative attitudes. And supposedly this explains moral motivation, because if you are in a conative state, you have certain motivation, that's just what the conative state is. And also it's supposed to explain some of the functions of moral language. If you go way back in the 20th century, you'll find at least two core functions that moral language are supposed to be fulfilling. So there's this AJA view that you're supposed to take moral stances or you are I'm sharing in a moral community by positioning myself in a certain way. That's what I do by expressing attitudes or just condemning is just self-locating myself in a 
as a take a particular view on society, right? Or a particular <laughs> position in society. And then Stevenson has this slightly different or perhaps very different view on what moral language is for, namely that it's a device for coordinating action, for per persuading people to act a certain way. And according to the expressivist or the traditional expressivist, um, the idea that moral terms express attitudes, they can explain both of these functions. So um, by expressing an attitude, you take a stance, you position yourself. So I'm letting you partake in my psychology. I want to be seen in a particular way, that's air. But also by expressing a cognitive attitudes, I'm inviting you to share in that attitude and thereby I co coordinate action. And that's in fact not special um, about moral attitudes. I can also by expressing a belief, I am self-locating myself, but I'm also inviting you to share your belief. That's what beliefs do. And this is this two-dimensionality of speech acts that Luca already mentioned between expressing attitudes, self-locating, and um, affecting the context, the coming ground. Okay, expressive. And that's also supposed to explain moral disagreement because if I say lying is wrong, you say lying is right, then we are having we are having opposite attitude. You can't take both stands at the same time, and you also can't coordinate on that basis. You have to resolve the disagreement to coordinate. And that's the explanation of moral disagreement. And this is all great. It's fantastic, but but Frege, <laughs> but Frege Beach problem really seems to sink this idea very badly, and that's a shame because it's such a good idea. And of course, what we know to be extra bad here is under negation and models. Because if we look at all the Frege Beaches, it's just a small selection of all the Frege Beaches. So we have Frege's original conditionals here, flying is wrong, feeling is wrong. And the problem here, as Frege pointed out about negation, right? You don't really express anything. There's no moral attitude being expressed by this condition, at least not obviously so. Um, Mark Schroeder's or Nicholas Unwin's problem, I say lying is not wrong. Well, then no disapproval is expressed, but also no approval is expressed. So I need a third attitude. And then, as Art pointed out, we are in kind of hot waters with having more and more and more attitudes. Um, also, Mark Schroeder pointed out the conjunctive Frege Beach problem. They say lying is wrong and common. This is a moral claim. This is a descriptive claim. What am I doing? Have I now, do I now have to admit mixed attitudes? Or um, like it goes out of hand at this point. And, Lying might be wrong, might be the worst one of the bunch, because it's not even clear what the expressivist would have would have to say about this. This is like some epistemically conative attitude, what that's supposed to be. And so even so even Mark Schroeder has been for you deal with this, you deal with this, you deal with this, and then he gets to this and he just goes, oh. so these are bad. It's a really big problem for expressivism. And we claim that inferential expressivism is how you solve all of this while keeping the good things. And so here's the idea. How do you express disapproval of lying in like a non sentential form? Well, we know this from into air. You just boo something. So lying, boo. And it even fits the general idea we have. So how do you express uh, disbelief? You say, uh, is it raining? No, you put a question to yourself and you react to it in a primal way. And so how do you express disapproval? You put like an action term to yourself and you react to it in a primal way. You go, right, that's more disapproval. Um, and then the more sophisticated way of expressing your moral attitudes by uttering, like, oh, lying is wrong. Um, that's the same thing, at least in unembedded contexts. And so we have this primal basic attitude here, frowny. So, but if you frown at some A, it's inferentially the same as expressing belief that A is wrong. And expressing belief that it's wrong is inferentially equivalent to um, frowning at it or disapproving of it in like a mm. way. And the same goes for like uh, approving. Again, from A, we have this idea how to express approval, but like, hooray! That's how you approve of like. And that's supposed to be inferentially equivalent to lying is right. So you have a little smiley here. If you're happy about A, that's the same as expressing your belief um, that A is right. And this explains the embeddings in a very obvious way, and even so obvious that I'm not even going to go through it. Because in all of these Fregedici things, you have then this thing here in a complex context, but that complex context is governed by an operator. You can apply an elimination rule and you get it in an unembedded context. And then you can reason with here all the way down to the expression of disapproval or approval. So if you say if lying is wrong, stealing is wrong, only a belief is expressed. There's no puzzle of what is expressed. It's a belief. It's a belief in a conditional. And I will get to that later. Um, 
And then, but where does this approval come in? Well, if you have expressed belief towards if lying is wrong, stealing is wrong, and then you go um, lying, boo, well, then you are committed to also agree that stealing, boo. And so you're reasoning directly with the attitudes without having the attitudes in the conditional. That's the beautiful thing about this inferentialist approach here. And it is, this is, uh, this is the worst weasel sentence in this entire talk. It's, it's expressivist insofar as the meanings depend on the attitudes. And expressivists have gotten very comfortable saying these things, um, which is actually because of um, Adam Gibbard, right, who has like no attitudes anywhere near, but say, oh, it's still expressivist because there's things going on. Um, but the question really is, if we do this, if we take this license here, do we still um, get all the nice things out? And there's good reason to believe that we might not, because, well, these are beliefs that's very non air Ian or Stevensonian, right? So we should think about this a little bit. Um, for our own methodology, we should also attend to that. So Luca introduced this my flash methodology. I'm just going to tell you quickly how this goes here. We have to identify a linguistic realization of one single expression, we have that lying rule, lying correct. These are non amenable plain, primal expressions of attitude. We have my favorite coordination principle. Um, if you smile at something and frown at something, that's not cool. <laughs> um, uh, we have the inferential relations of so wrong and rights, which would cool and correct, it's great. And um, we should also attend to which new inference preserve evidence. They kind of all do. There's also wishful thinking. I want to put wishful thinking back until lunch. Say, okay, so, um, but you can ask me about this over lunch, but not now. Um, but then, what do we do with the moral attitude? So, as I said, as Lucas said too, so there's two dimensions to speech acting. So you express your attitudes, you self looking you share your psychology, and you manage the context, you coordinate. Um, and we have four moral speech acts: booing and hooraying, and we say they express attitudes. Booing express disapproval, hooraying express approval. That's then the air function of vocabulary, you self locate And we also have essential effects associated with these speech acts, namely, what are they doing? Obviously, what do beliefs do? Beliefs update the suppositions. What do moral speech acts do? They update the moral suppositions. What else could they possibly be doing, right? So this, and this is Stevenson's function. So, um, we now have not just our common ground, our negative common ground, we have the moral common ground and the negative moral common ground. So the moral common ground contains all the things that, our, that all the participants in the conversation mutually suppose to approve of. So all the good things, charity is in there, justice is in there, all these good things. And there's the negative moral common ground, which are all the things that we mutually suppose to disapprove of. So I don't know, lying, stealing, murdering, these kind of things. And we can manage these common grounds just as much as we can manage all the other common grounds. And how do we manage them? Well, with specific speech acts. Um, assertions operate on the common ground, rejections operate on the negative common ground, and the moral speech acts operate on the moral common grounds. And so we get this picture here. We have, for each attitude expression, we have a particular common ground, or if you want to take like a an MIT grad here, if we want to have like a very broad picture, one aspect of the common ground that contains everything, right? Um, so it's not just the mutual beliefs that are updated, but really for each attitude you can have and express, you have a distinct way of managing the mutually supposed attitudes, which is beliefs, but also disbeliefs, disapprovals, approvals. Um, or in the case of the weak moderate speech, they are for management of all of this. And all the common grounds, they are mutually constraining. We already saw one of these constraints. So if a sentence A or, or a proposition, or the sentence A is in the common ground, then not A is in the negative common ground. That's the rules for negation. And, um, but now the common ground, the belief, the belief E1, also manages the or constrains the morally ones. So if A is wrong in the common ground, the belief E1, then the action A should be in the negative moral common ground. And if A is right, it's in the um, common ground and A should be in positive moral common ground. Um, it can't be the case that A is both in the positive and negative moral common ground. It's all the coordination principles expressing this. And what's interesting here now, and I think this is where we get Stevenson back properly, is by managing the non-moral common ground, by managing what we all agree to believe, 
we also manage the moral suppositions because of this mutual constraining here. So if I manage what we all believe about what's wrong and what's right and so on, then and we and this is really how we how the context is or how we represent the context, then by managing what we believe about rights and wrongs, we also manage about what we mutually suppose to disapprove or approve of. So if I convince you that lying is wrong and this becomes common ground between us, then I am in my right to continue in the conversation, assuming that you disapprove of lying. And that's this, um, that's this mutual constraining and that's this managing of the context or convincing function that Stevenson um, made such a big deal out of for very good reasons. And then we can answer the negation problem. So a contradiction expressivism, traditional expressivism has no choice but to say not wrong expresses tolerance. And but now in French expressivism, we don't need tolerance. So we don't need all the attitudes. Um, so the, the meaning of a certain line is not wrong is given by the inference rules for negation of the moral vocabulary. And these inference rules give you this. Asserting that lying is not wrong entails a strong rejection that lying is wrong. And so what's happening here, it's a bit of a mouthful, is you assert that lying is not wrong, and it leads to the following. You commit to proposing to modify the negative common ground, the ones where all the disbeliefs are in, so that disapproval of lying is incompatible with the shared suppositions. So you're saying, I am changing our mutual supposition so that we can all proceed in our conversation so that we don't suppose of each other that we disapprove of lying. That's what we're doing. And if you want to replace this, these three lines of technical English here with the word tolerance, um, please do. <laughs> but please keep in mind that it's not a primitive. It's um, something that's, that's an epiphenomenon of this, of the system, what we call tolerance. So we don't need all the attitudes. So at least Mark Schroeder should be happy here. But then there's a different problem. I think that's the biggest one. Motivating power. This is a semantic theory I've given you. It is very non-psychologistic. In principle, I could be a robot. I can express beliefs to you all day without having any beliefs. I just talked with Imogen about Star Trek. So commander data can express all kinds of attitudes uh, without, perhaps without actually having. So, but what about our motivation states? Uh, well, Kristen Wright has this fantastic idea that links what we do in language to what we are psychologically. And so um, the Wrightian principle here is someone who sincerely asserts that P believes that P. That sounds good. That's what sincerity means, right? I'm not going to explain to you what sincerity is, but we can all agree that whatever sincerity is, it's going to vindicate a principle like this. And since we have all these many attitudes now, how about we do this? Minimalism about the attitudes. Someone sincerely expressing attitude A has the attitude A. And then you get you come closer to explain more motivation. Because if I sincerely boo something, well then according to this principle, I am disapproving of that thing in a psychologically big sense, and thereby I'm motivated not to do it. So if, if, if I say lying, boo, and then you later catch me lying, you're well in your rights to call me hypocrite. But this doesn't explain why when I say lying is wrong, you later catch me lying. There's something gone wrong. We need a slightly more complicated principle for this. Um, who can I slaved over this principle? Um, so commitment to incoherence is what it's called. Let's go through it. So if you have an attitude A1, two, it is relevant for your current actions whether you have an attitude A2, and three, you know that expressing A1 would immediately commit you to expressing A2, then either you <coughs> already have A2 or you feel an incoherence in your mental state. I'm going to go over this now in detail. So relevant for action, that's difficult to explain in great form or detail, but we know from the like, common sense psychology and the celebrity and sense that um, sometimes whether you believe something is relevant for your action, sometimes it's not, right? So I have, I have certain beliefs about what is in my fridge in Connecticut, uh, but these beliefs are not very relevant for my actions right now. And it's like some transparent fact about psychology. And there are certain other beliefs I have about us going to lunch later that are very relevant for my actions because I have to finish on time. Right. And this is kind of transparent. It's difficult to explain this in more in relevance is a word that's always difficult to analyze, but here it's very transparent. It means, I think. Um, immediate commitment, as in the Yeltsin and Moore thing, immediately means just by simplifying according to meaning conferring rules. 
So the consequences of my belief in Peirce's law, they are not immediate, but the consequences of believing a conjunction for belief A and B, then both A and B are immediate. And incoherence. This is this uncomfortable feeling that, is, that you can resolve by just compartmentalizing. And I think it's the same thing that Derek and Jack call discordance. Jackson nodding, that's great. So discordance. <laughs> so, so, so then what does this principle mean? So the principle means, so I have an attitude A1. Um, and it is very saliently relevant for me whether I have attitude A2. I know that in my, in my linguistic action, if I were to express A1, I would have to commit to expressing A2. And then either I already have A2 or I something's wrong in my mind and I can feel that as like an uncomfortable state of discordance. Now, why would that be? Why would language have such a power to make me feel uncomfortable in my own head? And I think the answer here is some story about inner speech. Like it's a largely story about inner speech, that inner speech is a good model of how we think. It doesn't mean that we actually have inner speech in like a deep four-door kind of sense, but just that what, what this here says, this is not a psychological law that I expect to be realized on the brain. I expect this to be a scientific principle that is a good explanatory story or a predictive story about how the mind actually functions, quite regardless of about how the mind actually functions. But if, this, if, we, if you grant us this, then um, what follows is if you assert that A is wrong and you do so, you do so sincerely, then you believe that A is wrong, and because by an immediate rule, uh, you get disapproval of A, well, then you have to also disapprove of A on pain of incoherence. So if I sincerely judge lying is wrong, and then by sincerity, it pops into my mind, and by this principle, I either am motivated not to lie, or I will feel like discordant. So perhaps in this case, a bad conscience. So this is how you get motivational power. And so despite the fact that, our, that this is in fact expressing a belief, the link to cognitive attitudes, as we set it up, is still strong enough so that we get motivational power out. And I think that's one of the very important parts here. And so there's this word, saving the differences. I got this from the lead bar on, but I think Matthew Krishnan also likes to use that word. What are the differences and how have we saved them? Um, so all assertions express beliefs, period. I'm complete, we are completely with Krishnan right on this one. They express beliefs, and if you sincerely assert, you have to believe. But the meaning of what is asserted is given by these inferential relations between attitude expressions. And this means that the content, the content of a moral assertion depends on cognitive attitudes. And that's something special about moral assertions, because other assertions don't depend, don't have contents that depend on cognitive moral attitudes. And this difference extends to the mental. If you believe me on this vaguely the larger story about mind, language, and inner speech, and so on. Um, the difference that the assertion that something is wrong depends on a cognitive attitude in a way that other assertions do not. In the same way, the belief that lying is wrong depends on cognitive attitudes in a way that other beliefs do not. So here are the differences, and I hope they are saved. Uh, how much time do I have? If you want half hour discussion, you have 15 minutes. Cool. Conditionals. Okay, forget everything about morals. We're going to talk about conditionals now. Uh, because as Luca promised, if you have this basic multilateral framework in place, you can do two things to generalize it further. Um, you can just add more signs. You can have the frownies and the smileys, and you can have the O pluses and the O minuses and so on. But you can also start adding different types of force indicators, right? Who said that you can only express attitudes towards a single sentence? Perhaps you can express attitudes to two or three or four sentences. And what we have seen so far were just unary indicators, but why not have binary operators and have them model conditional speech acts? And with everything we have said so far, this is going to be extremely straightforward. Um, and here's our inspiration. Uh, Michael Dammit, this is from Framework Philosophy of Language. So the whole context, if A then a question, should be taken as constituting a single force operator, namely one signalizing, the asking of a question conditionally upon it being the case that A, or better yet, the context if, then question mark, should be regarded as a force indicator with two argument places. So you already get this from Dummett on Frege, and if you really read Frege very carefully, you might um, squint a little bit and see it in Frege already. Um, 
And so the idea here is this is conditional assertion or conditional questioning here is not doing something with A and then doing something with B. Consequent is doing something with two things at the same time. It's a unified speech act. And to appreciate the difference, this is one of these cases where formalization, I think, really helps. So here's the difference. What you can do is assert a conditional, just like conditional as like a material condition as we know it. So you assert a single belief in a single proposition in the proposition being if A then B. And you can model this as like this, plus if A then B. And this conditional can embed a negation, for example. But if you have the binary force indicator, you do one thing with two contents. You assert conditionally on A, it's one word, that B. And you can model it some, something like this, a force indicator with an arrow and a little plus, and it has two arguments. And in, in an obvious way, there's no, you can't negate that. You can't put a negation in front of this here, you can't put a negation in front of the parentheses. And if you put a, put a negation anywhere in front of A or B, you're not scoping over the entire conditional. So here's the difference. You can assert a single thing, or you can do something, a speech acty thing, with two contents. And in this case, um, you can assert conditionally on the first one and the second one. And both of these are in fact needed to account for all the data. So Dummett and Frege had the conditional questions. And so obviously you can't really assert a proposition that expresses the conditional question because questions aren't assertions. So no inquisitive semanticists here, I get to say that. Um, but also like obviously conditions embed, so you can't eat both. And so you have like a Frege Gichi thing here. Um, so both Dummett and Edrington Dorothy Edgington favor <coughs> the conditional speech accounts to all the conditionals. But what about something like this? If the light goes on, if you flip the switch, the electrician came. That's a perfectly intelligible sentence. And you have a conditional inside a conditional antecedent. That's a classical for each. But of course, you can also say it is not the case that if you flip the switch, then the light goes on. It's a perfectly intelligible sentence, and it negates the conditional. So it can't just be a conditional speech act. <coughs> And both Dummett and Edgington know that. And so Dummett says, um, yeah, it's just not good language to use. I, I'm, I'm against that. It's not the Queen's, it's not the Queen's English, OK? Um, and Edgington says, it's not typical, but you can do like ad hoc pragmatic things with them to understand it. And what she thinks is happening is what you actually are embedding is a non-conditional replacement. So I tell you, if the light goes on, if you flip the switch, the electrician came, your brain goes like, Meh. What do I do with this if the light goes on and flip the switch? Oh, this means if the cables are working. And so you read this as, oh, if the wiring is in this, okay, that the electrician came, um, or the circuits are fixed or whatever. And so you just ad hoc replace that. But when you say, these are perfectly good sentences, and there's nothing ad hoc about the interpretation, right? You know what they mean. Um, and so I think we should be putting a bit more pressure on this. And many people have, of course. So a very, Famous typical response is to say, we're not doing an ad hoc replacement here, we just re reanalyze these to a different logical form. So if the light goes on, if you flip the switch, then the electrician came actually means if you press the switch and the light goes on, then the electrician came. So um, import export, right? And the negation one is the negation hops in the consequence. So it, it is not so that if you flip the switch, the light goes on, it means, literally means, if you flip the switch, then the light does not go on. Um, but you have to be very, very careful about what we mean by this explanation. Because, cool, if this is a claim about logical form, well, then you need to give a syntactic reason or a syntax semantics interface reason, like a Kratzer Heim style reason <laughs> for why that is so. And Kratzer has a good story for this one. She does not have a good one for this one. There's no syntactic, I can promise you, there's no syntactic reason to think that an if becomes an and. Um, I have not never seen anything like that. Um, but if, and this is amongst philosophers, a lot more common, we just claim equivalence. But equivalence doesn't really help you here. Because if you claim that this is equivalent to that, this is equivalent to that, well, then this one still needs a truth value. Right? If you want to claim that two things are equivalent, you can't use that to deny that one thing has a meaning. Only meaningful things can be equivalent to other things. And so if you say these are equivalent, you're making a cute claim about conditionals, but you're not solving for each. And so now, how do we see this? So it's conditions 
I mean, this condition is I always wanted, or as we always wanted, <laughs> but I'm trying, trying to convince you that it's what you always wanted to. So here's the inferential express this story. We have this a condition assertion marker here, and it has a modus ponens, obviously, right? Condition. You assert B conditionally on A, and you also assert A, but then you're committed to B. And um, the embeddable conditional flips with the unembeddable one, just as with all the other inferential expressive things. And you do the same for conditional rejection, conditional disapproval, conditional approval, yada, yada, yada. And you do the same again for subjunctives, right? You can also subjunctively conditionally assert on easy. And then you get a theorem, and, that, and you really get the theorem that negation scopes in the consequent um, equivalently. Both of these have a meaning. And they have their own meaning, but it's inferentially equivalent. This follows immediately from conditional rejection because you just go, well, assume this one is false, bad things happen. There you go. And so if you just do the inferential explicit story, you have solve for each because you have the embeddable and the unembeddable one, but you also vindicate these intuitions about where negation is scope. And you vindicate it in the right way, both have a meaning, and you don't need to mess with syntax to get it out. For the proof, I have to refer to the book. But then there's something else we might want to be doing. We want to be able to introduce these conditions into our um, language. So, as Lucas said, we always have like introduction and elimination rules. I expute that we have an elimination rule for conditionals <coughs> for exponents, but we do we should have some means to introduce them. And there's only one proof theoretic principle that is remotely used for producing conditionals. That's a conditional proof rule. The problem is it's false. Um, it doesn't work, um, but it almost works, and we can fix it. So, and we all know why this is false. Um, let's start with subjunctive conditions. So, we all, again, we all know that conditional proof is invalid for subjunctives because they are not factual. Um, what was it? Adams told us that this following is not true. If Oswald hadn't shot Kennedy, somebody else would have. That doesn't sound true. I mean, it's not like it was, it's not God given that Kennedy had to be shot. Um, and here is how you would like to introduce this condition using conditional proof. You know background knowledge that someone shot Kennedy, and then, but then you shouldn't do the following. You shouldn't say, well, suppose Oswald didn't do it. Well, therefore, by my background knowledge, somebody shot Kennedy, and therefore, by conditional proof, if Oswald hadn't done it, somebody else would have. This is wrong. This is not a good argument. This is not how you how you defend to somebody that uh, if Oswald hadn't shot Kennedy, somebody else would have. And the mistake here is obvious. You can't use this background knowledge. So you know somebody shot Kennedy and you know it was Oswald. So if you go in the hypothetical context where Oswald didn't shoot Kennedy, you shouldn't import this knowledge here. You should only import factually compatible knowledge. Okay, this is, we know that. But the same thing, we might not know this, happens for esteem, um, indicative conditionals. Because indicative conditionals are counter epistemic. Yes, that's a new word. <laughs> um, here's the example. Um, suppose I'm in a room, no windows, I hear pitter patter on the roof, and so I know, oh, it might be raining. I don't know that it is raining. Yeah, my roof has all kinds of weird features, but it might be raining. And then I shouldn't do the following. I shouldn't do, well, suppose it's not raining. Oh, well, I know it might be raining. So therefore, if it isn't raining, it might be raining. That's not cool. <laughs> It's a bad argument. And so the mistake again is we can't use this background knowledge. If I if I consider um, if I go in the hypothetical context where it's not raining, I shouldn't import any of my epistemically modal claims about it possibly raining. That's just a mistake. And so just like in the count in the supposition for a factual conditional, we can only import factually compatible premises. For indicative conditionals, we can only import epistemically compatible premises. And so we get this unified picture of how conditionals are introduced in this course. Indicative conditional proof is if from A and epistemically compatible assumptions, you can infer B, you get if it is A and B. And the subjunctive, we all know this one, is <coughs> if from A and factually compatible assumptions, you can infer B, well, you can then get if it were A, then it would be B. And so conditionals, we know that, exist in subjunctive and indicative, they exist as embeddings, conditional speech acts, and really the only difference is the availability of the side premises. So there's like a uniform account of if. It, if performs many functions, again, this is not news. We all knew that if and subjunctive and indicatives and conditional speech, like this are all the things we can do with this 
wonderful word if. Um, but on this account, all these many, many functions, they are very similar in kind, at least. We have the unembeddable if, we have the embeddable if, we have the indicative if, we have the subjunctive if, but they can all be introduced and eliminated the same way, except the availability of side premises. And that's, there has to be some story about why the subjunctive mood manages this. And I can't tell you one, but there has to be one. <laughs> but this is the only thing the difference if the subjunctive mood manages the availability of side premises. And indeed, even in the indicative, <coughs> already not all the side premises are available. So it's not surprising that there's like a restricting operator you can add to the antecedent. Um, Julian, what's compatibility? I don't know. <laughs> um, and nobody knows, nobody can know. Um, this is just a limit to what can be formalized. I mean, I can tell you that A, and it might be not A, I'm compatible. I can tell you that um, um, somebody shot, so, but already to know that somebody shot Kennedy is incompatible with Oswald didn't shot Kennedy, you have to go read a history book. I can't tell you this from philosophy, right? Facts about what's compatible can't be known from the armchair. And in fact, everybody agrees on that. So if you do pick your favorite Louis Stallmaker style analysis of subjunctives, there's going to be closeness or similarity. And of course, neither Lewis nor Stalling can give you an answer to which worlds are closer to which other worlds. Um, it's all just intuition milling. But of course, we can, when we want to reason with this, we can make some closeness facts explicit by endorsing some conditions as premises. If we just, if we believe that the closeness story is right and we want to say which worlds are closer to which others without using this meta language, but well, we endorse certain conditions. Um, and we can also make assumptions about the structure of closeness, right? Lewis Don and Sonica have like a huge fight about like the limit principle. And we can have, we can have these fights. Um, but we can also have these fights on the proof theoretic story I just outlined. Um, we can make certain facts we want to endorse explicit by having certain conditions as axioms. So if I want to inform you of the fact that um, somebody shot Kennedy and um, Oswald didn't show Kennedy are incompatible, I can just endorse the conditional um, that I just showed you. If Oswald hadn't done it, then no, it's not the case that if Oswald hadn't done it, somebody else would have. I can just inform you of that fact that way. And we can also make certain structural assumptions. So we can make the assumption, for example, that Boolean sentences, so ones containing no models, are always epistemically compatible with each other. Um, or I can endorse certain coordination principles that entail conditional exclude middle, and in fact, our, our coordination principles do. So we can make these structural assumptions, but I can't tell you what compatibility is. But this doesn't mean that there's nothing to be gained here. And I just, for the last five, I'm going to take five more minutes, I will turn to one of these applications. So what? Um, here's a terrible problem about conditional. Um, Alan Gibbert's, and again, Gibbert, Gibbert is everywhere. Okay, so the Gibbert collapse. So Gibbert showed that problematically the indicative seems to be collapsing into the material with very simple assumptions. And why is this false? Well, here's why it's false. Uh, I say cotton is not a rabbit. And then the indicative, if cotton is a rabbit, then cotton is a bird. Well, that sounds bad. Um, the material conditional, either cotton is not a rabbit or cotton is a bird, is true. It's very simple. And Gibbert's proof that these two should be equivalent relies on this import export principle and some incredibly trivial assumptions. And so if you really look into it, so in our semantics of the conditional, so we have the advantage here that our semantics, our meaning for the conditional is given by proof theoretic rules. So if we want to know is import export valid, we can look at how do we derive it. If you have a truth conditional story, you can observe that input export is valid, but you don't really know why. <coughs> but if you have if you have a proof theory, you can see can I prove import export and then see oh where does the proof go wrong. And if you do that, you will see that the restrictions on um, epistemic compatibility, compatibility, in fact, block the Gibbert collapse. Because um, the relevant instance of conditional proof here requires that the material conditional, cotton is either not a rabbit or a bird, needs to be compatible with the sentence cotton is a rabbit. And you can already see that this is not going to work. Because um, background knowledge, cotton is either not a rabbit or a bird. Now we enter a suppositional context. Suppose cotton is a rabbit. Then in the suppositional context, is cotton a bird? 
And if, if I could import this assumption here into this context and by the strong syllogism, the answer should be yes. Uh, but the answer is obviously no, because cotton can't be both a rabbit and a bird. And so, because the answer to this question under the supposition is no, we can observe here that the rules of the language game or our everyday assessment of what comp compatibility is entails that cotton is either on a rabbit or a bird is not compatible with cotton as a rabbit. And therefore, you can't use input export to show this Gilbert collapse here. Um, and so the point here is input export is valid in many, many instances whenever there is this comp compatibility facts. And so many indicative conditionals are in fact equivalent to material conditionals. But in all the bad cases, like where cotton is involved here, there's the reason why we don't want material indicative to be the same here is that there's a compatibility fact that's failing. And then Gibbert's proof doesn't go through for the bad cases. So you can have a lot of valid instances of Gilbert's proof, you can have a lot of valid instances, instances of import export. You can't have the bad ones because the bad ones are like this. So to sum up, inferential explicit mode conditional has, we have them both as feature and as embeddables and predictives and subjunctives. The account is uniform in that the only variability is in the restrictions of conditional proof. Subjunctives are counterfactuals, indicatives are counter steaming. The negated conditions are in fact equivalent to negating conditionals. And in almost all cases, you also get import export, except in the cases where the Gibbert collapse would be bad. <laughs> but still, many instances remain valid. Okay, uh, yeah, cool, sketches. Um, you can also do truth. You can do truth in the obvious way. It is true that A switches with plus A. There's a freaking each problem here because you can embed the truth predicate and it solves the exact same way as before. Um, if you do it cleverly, as we do, uh, you get no liar and no carding combined with the theory of conditionals before. Um, I do want to say that because it's going to come up in the end of the discussion. So all the other attitudes, hoping, fearing, lamenting, cherishing that line is wrong, it is raining, it might be Tuesday. What about, what about these attitudes? What if I fear that it might be Tuesday and line is wrong, whatever. Um, Sellers does that for us. He's pretty, he's pretty smart. Um, so if you just extend the Zellarsian mind language story and say like, well, common sense psychology, it's giving you the right story about talk about the attitudes. And then if you have this minimalism about the attitudes, well, then that's also the right story about the mind itself. And that's something we call thin mentalism. Um, the attitudes don't have to be psychologically real in here. It doesn't have to be like substantive, thick, shot me an MRI and show me my beliefs attitudes, but um, I have them in the thin sense that I can express them and then our social practice habit produces so sincerely, well then you have them in some way. You are a certain way. I am constituted a certain way if I sincerely express a belief and that's just then this constitution is then the belief itself, even if the neuroscientists can't find it. So to sum up both talks, <laughs> Freddy Geach is everywhere. <laughs> and expressivism makes so much sense in so many contexts and always Freddy Geach. But if you take this proposal about reasoning with attitude seriously as we do, then you can have these explanations because you have proper beliefs, thin beliefs, but proper beliefs um, that contain the expressivist vocabulary, you can reason with it, and you still, through immediate inference and these mind language bridges, you can still have all the good things. Um, we have to, we, we, I, I talked to Luca, we are decided to own the label. This is cognitive <coughs> expressivism, um, assertions, express beliefs, 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 beliefs. Um, but the meaning of what is asserted may depend on the cognitive attitude. So it's not a hybrid theory. It's not that we do both at the same time. It's genuine beliefs, but the, but the beliefs themselves have a bare relation to the cognitive things. And this is for ARC, um, simple attitudes towards complex contents. There are more than one simple attitude. There's many simple attitudes, but they don't proliferate. To have like a conjunction or, con or conditional or negation, you don't need to make up new attitudes. We have like eight. <laughs> and if, if
Yeah. 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 Yeah.